an excuse that they say we have not we have not submitted our plan to the Department of Education because we're still waiting on school districts uh, to submit the the list of funding needs. Well, that I've uh, done a little search around, and many of the local school districts in Florida have submitted their request for funds. Uh, so here here's where we are. Uh, the state uh, owes Hillsborough County Public Schools an estimated seven, $574 million. Uh, it's wrong. It's, uh, it's outrageous that they continue to do this at a time where we're in the worst public health crisis uh, of our lifetimes, and we've got to do everything we can to make up for learning losses and keep our, our kids safe in our local public schools. So with that, I think, uh, Damaris, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I want to thank you for being such an outspoken advocate for our students and schools and helping to educate other parents who are busy just trying to get through the day and oftentimes don't have time to, to dig into the, the fine points of, of all of this. But uh, thanks so much. And please fill us in on what else we need to know. Yes, thank you so much, first of all, for having me and, and for raising this conversation because it is so important. It is very hard for parents to keep up with these things. Um, to go back to the funding that you mentioned earlier, you know, I think it's important to note that one of the reasons we had just recently applied for both the balance of lump sum and the technology assistance on 912 is when we applied for it, is because we were waiting for the Department of Education, the Florida Department of Education, to release the application and expectations to us. So while they say they haven't, uh, we haven't applied, it's, it's kind of like our schools are. They're not setting us up for success. And I think that's the bottom line here. You can see that great uh, played out really well on the House floor uh, during last session. Representative, um, uh, I have just lost her name. Huh. Representative Valdez, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. spoke up and, and asked, you know, basically we're meant to be a pass through. The ESSER funds were supposed to come from the federal government, go through us, so it's an easy way to get out for the school districts. Why are we holding this up? Why are we slowing it down? And the repre and representative find answered very clearly, because we can. And I think that's incredibly concerning to me as a parent, right? We're holding up money just because we can. That's not setting our kids up for success. When asked about why we didn't apply for the additional assistance for needy children who are hungry, it was because, well, they're in school. Well, the reality is, not all of our kids are in school. We had a high number of kids in quarantine because they weren't able to wear masks in school or we had to fight for masks in school to keep them safe and in school. So at one point in Hillsborough County, we had 12,000 kids out of school quarantined or sick with the virus that had no access to food that typically would have. And when you consider 62% of our students are on free and reduced lunch, which often makes them eligible for those additional benefits, that's really concerning. 62% of 12,000 kids is a lot of kids going out with, without breakfast and lunch, which is often their main meals of the day, right? If they don't have the access to get that at home. So those are really important things to, to to recognize and to get involved reach out to your legislators tell them you're frustrated our kids need this money to succeed our schools have been asked to open up and we did so our teachers have been stretched thin i don't know a single teacher who's like great this is going fine everything's wonderful last year they had to simultaneous teach while trying to trying to manage a class in person and how many of us could could balance that and do it really well i I, I would argue almost none of us, right? And so we've had to make all these accommodations, but we haven't been given the tools to be successful. And so parents need to use their voice, reach out to their local legislatures, reach out to the Department of Education. Um, they've had no problems having emergency board meetings over penalizing us for having masks in school. Yet I haven't heard a single emergency board meeting being called over not receiving our ESSER funds. So we need to be vocal in all ways possible. Great, thanks, Damaris. And you uh, rightfully mentioned the hardworking teachers who have been called upon to do so much. And we're fortunate to have one of those uh, teachers with us, Emily Lee, who is a Title I elementary school teacher here in Hillsborough County. Uh, Emily, thank you so much. I would love, and I know everyone would love to hear a teacher's perspective on 
how it's going and, and um, how you think we could put some of these emergency dollars that are owed to good use. Thank you so much for having me and, and having the opportunity to be here with you guys and, and give our perspective from the classroom. As you guys mentioned before, food is a big thing. Okay, we know that our students don't learn unless they have their basic needs met. So starting with their basic needs, that will help us along in the classroom. But I think a lot of this money could go towards our students and serving them in a way that would allow us to maybe have smaller class sizes, to have more resources inside of our school. And we know that our kids have been missing out on a lot of their learning and being able to meet certain requirements. And so it would really help if we had more people and more resource, resources in here, you know, actually reaching the kids every day. <clears throat> That's so interesting because I, I've looked around the country, just a very cursory look at how uh, other communities and local school districts are using their ESSER emergency aid funds. They're uh, extending summer school they are providing stipends for teachers and educators, the whole, the whole education uh, staff. Uh, they're encouraging vaccines. They are providing teachers with uh, extra money to serve as tutors for students to help make up learning losses. Uh, anything, remember the, the, the available use uh, or the allowable use for all these funds is very broad. The right. academic needs of students, their social needs, their developmental needs, their mental health needs. Uh, so right. if you're, the, I imagine there, if, they're, uh, if you're in Title I, you see some students that could use a little extra tutoring or maybe some uh, help with uh, their emotional strain during all of this. Absolutely. This would be the time when the money really, really, really needs to get dumped in for the resources that you're talking about, academic resources, socio-emotional resources for them. And we do reach out and unfortunately the answer is we just don't have the money. We're aware I think in our county that we should have smaller class sizes and all of the things that would help our students succeed but the answer is we can't do it. And it makes it um, very stressful not necessarily just for the teachers, but you're looking at a group of students that you know that you're not able to meet their needs best. And more and more and more keeps getting put on. But like you mentioned, there's less and less and less money to do it all with. And so it's, it makes a very big strain. Um, a lot of us have been working through crowdsourcing and um, awesome donors in the community to try to fill the gaps but it still leaves a lot of inequities. Um, you know, I'm gonna get ready to do my science stuff. Everyone's gonna get ready to do science Olympics. That's all going to come out of our pocket for the most part because the money's not coming in from where it's supposed to. And if we want our kids to have those experiences, we do it, we crowdsource it, we find a way to make it happen. But it's not fair if there is money there that's supposed to be paying for these resources that's just getting held. Well, thank you, Emily. So um, one of the great educators of um, here in Hillsborough County is Doretha Edgecombe, who's served for many years on the Hillsborough County School Board. And Doretha, I'm so grateful that you can zoom in with us uh, tonight and give folks, help us um, kind of with a little advice about how we can help organize parents into a force to be reckoned with, to, to get through to Governor DeSantis and the folks in Tallahassee that we, our educators and students need these emergency aid dollars and we need them now. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and for that gracious introduction. As I listened to both Damaris and Emily, I started to be, think about the past and how the landscape over time has changed. But there are some things that have not changed in terms of providing for our students. We've always had students who have needs. And somehow in Hillsborough County, we've worked hard and we try to be honest and open and most of all humane about ensuring that those students got the very best that they, they deserve 
and we have the money here. So there's not a need for us to talk about where we are going to find it. It's there in Wash in, in, in Tallahassee, just waiting to be released. I want to go back and reinforce what both the mayors and Emily said. Let's go out and talk to your legislators. Annoy them, speak up, call them, send emails, do whatever is necessary for your voice to be heard. You are first of all a parent, you're an advocate, and most of all, you're a voter. So it's important to remember your roles that you can play and to make these things happen. I also want to also emphasize the fact that in this district, we have creative, hardworking staff people who are just waiting to do something about meeting the needs of our students. Release the money. And believe me, in Hillsborough County, we have people who will know what to do, how to do it, where it should go, and most of all, how to ensure that our students are getting not only the best education, but the highest quality education. And also that we retain and attract outstanding teachers like Emily. If we don't have the money to do that, we can't talk about quality education. We can't talk about a quality community because they go hand in hand. And so, yes, I'm gonna say it again, be absolutely annoying if you have to be in order to have your voices heard. It's just, it's your right as a voter, you, it's your right as a taxpayer, your right as a parent, your right as a person who lives in this community, and you say that we want this to be a high quality, healthy community where all children get the best education that they can, well, we can't do it on a few pennies. We need that money and the money is there and there's absolutely no reason, no reason that it should not be released. Well, thank you, Doritha, so much. And I hope folks know who their legislators are. Everyone is represented in Tallahassee by a state representative and a state senator. And State Senator Janet Cruz with, was on with us during the first education town hall. And she's been outspoken uh, about to, to, to uh, the education commissioner, Richard Corcoran, and to Governor DeSantis to release the funds. If you're represented by a Republican uh, legislator, state senator, or uh, or state rep, boy, they really do need need to hear from you. So I think Ricky, we're we're ready to go to questions. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for your questions and welcome to everyone on Facebook. We apologize for the technical difficulties and we'll be sure to get this conversation up in full after it ends. But if you have a question on Facebook, you can type it into the chat box. If you wanna hit the comment section, we will see your questions there as well and then continue to send them in here on Zoom as well as raising your hand. First, we will go to Paula. Paula, you are now live with our speakers. Hi, this is Paula Castaño. I'm one of the co-leaders of Hillsboro Public School Advocates here in Hillsboro County. I'm also here with Pat Hall from the League of Women Voters who we've been working closely with. We've aligned with many other Florida organizations who are all fighting for uh, funding in Florida to be increased uh, across um, per pupil spending, but we're particularly been advocating, as Ms. Edgecombe has said, we have been relentlessly advocating on a federal, state, and local level for the uh, ESSER three funds to be applied for. The deadline was missed on, uh, was it June 7th, uh, by the Department of Education, and we're also advocating for the food assistance uh, money that they failed to receive from the federal government. Our biggest question is this. We have been relentlessly, relentlessly advocating. How, what are the repercussions for the Department of Education and for Governor DeSantis and the fact that they have not applied for these funds, the fact that they're not expeditiously going after these funds? Is there anything else that we can do? Uh, we call, we write, we email, we tweet. Every legislator, every single person on the federal level. Uh, we also speak regularly at school board meetings to try to get our superintendent to speak up and to send a formal letter on our behalf. What else can we do? What are the repercussions for the people that are not applying for the money? 
Paula, thank you so much. And uh, regards to Pat Hall, longtime uh, educator herself and, and so knowledgeable. Uh, she's really helped me on a number of issues. So you're doing the right thing. Um, there, you know, I'm grateful that the Biden administration and uh, the Federal Education Secretary Cardona did weigh in. He he's he came in with backup uh, per public health protocols on the masking issue, and, and I mean this is just mind blowing that we have a, a governor who is not standing up for the public health and safety, especially in our schools, as as our local school board members courageously said, you know, temporarily while we have this very contagious Delta variant surge, it, it's appropriate to keep everybody safe and, and have kids wear masks. Um, so just, I think that was, um, that was welcome to have the Biden administration and Secretary Cardona come in and say, we've, we've got your back on that. Um, we've, we've asked them whether we have to go through the state of Florida. And unfortunately, under law, yes, we do. And that's why we put in the language in the, in the law that you, the state had to make an allocation uh, at an, in an expedited and timely manner and to the extent practical, not later than 60 days after the receipt of such funds. Then they played this game where they didn't apply for the funds to come to the state. So there, there may be some legal avenue, but gosh, that would be so wasteful. <laughs> uh, but I know folks are, are, are really frustrated out there and I share your frustration. I think the most important thing continues to be organizing parents and educators speaking out to those, uh, especially the GOP legislators who can have some uh, say along with our, our Democratic allies and just uh, continuing to speak out and, and provide uh, that, that uh, keeping the pressure on. Damaris, you've really been keeping the pressure on. What else can, can parents and advocates be doing in your opinion? Um, I think they can be sharing their frustration with other parents. I think that's really key here. I think that the vast majority of constituents don't know what their legislators are doing and that they are stopping this from happening. Um, obviously, I mean, I can say this, obviously we have a Republican controlled House, Senate and, and uh, governor, right? Um, and I would argue that the vast majority of Republicans do not realize, uh, constituents do not realize what their leaders are doing. And once they become aware, they get really, really angry. So the more we can educate and empower people to, to as Ms. Edgecombe said, be annoying. I'm a big fan of that. Um, set an alarm. And I had, a, I had a, an elected official once that would not respond to me. So I literally set an alarm on my phone to email them every single week. And it took four weeks and I got a meeting, but you know, just doing things like that that are really simple, keeping keeping the pressure on. Um, I'm, I'm a co-leader of, of the group that Paula mentioned, Hillsborough Public School Advocates. Follow people who know, who know, who are up on this stuff because it's a lot to keep up on these issues. So, um, and then, respond to calls to action. PTA puts out calls to action, Hillsborough Public School Advocates, Hillsborough Alliance, or the Alliance for Public School. All of these people put out calls to action and follow through on them because the more people they hear from, the more likely they are to respond. And then vote. <laughs> like, <laughs> if they don't listen, vote. Uh, the bottom line is, is that elected officials work for the people, not the other way around. Um, and I think that's really important to remember. If I can add one other group that I haven't heard mentioned, where is the business community? What about them being allies with this? If we talk about a safe community and ed well-educated uh, city and community, people who are gonna be ready for employment, people that's gonna make this the place where everybody wants to come to live, the business community ought to have uh, an important and vocal voice in this. And so I hope that you will reach out, Paula, and, and those, uh, those of you who have the other groups organized and, and our other allies, and ask the community, our business community, to come with us and stand up for us because we're standing up for future citizens of this community and we need their support and voices. All right, Ricky, next question. 
Thank you so much. Just a reminder to everyone on Facebook that you can submit your questions in the comments section and on here, you can do it a few ways. You can hit the raise hand button right next at the bottom of your screen. You can hit the chat feature at the bottom of your screen and you can hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So next we'll go to an anonymous question. So that's another point. If you don't want us to go live to you, you can also submit your question anonymously. So an anonymous question that we received is, has the state made any indication that they intend to apply for these two funding sources, either the ESSER funds or food, and is there a deadline that they've missed? Yes, they've missed the deadline, uh, but um, they, uh, the, the U.S. Department of Education has said they, of course, understanding that the schools and students come first, they're, they're not threatening to uh, cut the state of Florida off. Uh, they're, they're, the, I think we've got to continue, we have to, to hammer home the point now that Florida is the last remaining state uh, to leave these funds on the table. That puts us at a, and our, our students at a distinct disadvantage. Uh, why would our state leaders allow that to happen? Why would they allow our students to, to not have this, the same amount of nutritious meals uh, to get them through the school day as, as kids in other states. And why, why would we not bring every resource to bear to make sure the mental health care of our, our children in schools is taken care of or that, that we address learning losses or, or the gaps in technology? Um, Damaris, what do you say to, to that question? Um, uh, yeah, I would just agree with everything, <laughs> everything you just said. I don't really have anything uh, additional, uh, you know, to, to say. Great, we can go to our next question. Up next, we have a question from Angie Smith. Angie, you should be live. There you go. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I... Thank you so much for um, having this. And I agree with everything that's been said. I guess the thing that keeps coming out is that we're just sort of up against some people that really are just doing what they want and has have really very little concern for what people want because we're pestering, we're calling, we're talking about this in every way we can. And their answer is to just say, well, we're just doing it because we can and we don't have to listen to you. Um, and these are the people in charge of our kids. <laughs> it's really, really very scary to think that we don't have any, any way to make what's supposed to happen happen, which is elected people should be representing what people want. Um, but my specific question was just about class sizes because I think it's just another detail in the bigger picture of, um, finding little ways to sort of sneak around rules where we were supposed to have a certain cap of students per teacher, um, but it seems like they're just kind of ignoring that and firing teachers and letting the, the number just basically be irrelevant. So how can we say, look, we can't fire teachers because now we have 30 kids in a class or 25 kids in a class and they're supposed to be maybe like 20 or 18 um, it seems like they're just using all these little rules to say, well, we don't need this many teachers. So actually our budget's fine and we don't need the money. And it's just another way to like, sort of, you know, chip away at what we have. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. I, I hear the frustration in your voice and I, I understand. And, and just to, for all the people out there, do not give up on this. It is tough in the state of Florida, oh, you know, over the past a uh, decade or so, the support for public education has really taken a hit. I mean, it did, it took a long time to get to 46 out of 50 states in support for our students. And it, it uh, was kind of a devious plan, wasn't it, to not adhere to class sizes. And boy, with smaller class sizes really would have come in handy during COVID and we can still do it because we do have uh, emergency aid out there that we could use to hire additional teachers, hire more substitutes, hire additional aids, uh, spread out our classrooms, help keep kids safe. So it kind of, it, 
it goes to this long standing erosion at the state level for support of our public school students and schools, but you you don't give up and and all of you advocates out there just keep at it like Damaris does and so I'm gonna go to Damaris and maybe Emily can explain what it means to have a manageable classroom uh, when you're trying to educate young kids. Um, so I have older kids and one of the things that I found out with class size that I didn't realize is that U.S. history is regulated in size, but AP U.S. history is not regulated. So core curriculum classes are regulated in size, but our non-core curriculum classes are not regulated so they can surpass that. And the AP versions of our non-core curriculum classes are not regulated. So classes where you could you would think they would be regulated aren't necessarily regulated. So that's problematic to begin with. Um, in addition to that, if you have kids that need any additional assistance at all, and I'm sure Emily can attest to this, I've, I'm not a teacher. At best, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I spent my career working in, in children's ministry and youth ministry, but I also understand that when you get, you know, a bunch of sixth graders into a room or a bunch of kindergartners into a room, that class size matters. Um, take two kids to a park and take five kids to a park. Any parent can tell you that's the truth. Um, and so I think it really comes down is that you get this one size fits all class when you have more kids. And that's really, really challenging for the kids who just aren't you know, able to go about their work on their own. Emily? Yes, manageability is everything. And the younger the students get, the more structures they need in place, the more support they need in place um, academically and just getting used to routines. And we have to remember that when we have 30 or more kindergartners sitting in a class, these children haven't been in school yet because of the, you know, the way the past year has gone. And so all of the students, you know, haven't had a stable, normal schooling for a couple of years. And so the smaller the class sizes means that we can access all of their academic needs, access what their emotional needs are, because they're a lot right now. They have sick family members. They have parents that might not have jobs, been unemployed. Things are really, really stressful for families and our children feel that no matter how young they are. And so that's a manageability that needs to be able to happen to meet those needs. And if you have a classroom full of students that might have three to four years worth of needs. You might have a reading level, the kindergarten, you might have all the way up to fifth grade. If you have 30 kids in that room, you cannot get them everything that they need to be successful. And so the frustration that I hear from teachers is that they can't reach their students' needs because there are too many of them in the classes. And students, it's not good for their well-being just the feeling of being in a room for six hours a day when they're not getting what they need, it's very stressful for them. And it's leading to sometimes more detrimental learning loss than you know what we could have if we had smaller rooms and you can have 15 or 18 kids to a teacher. And so the kids, I feel, I feel very badly that they are just kind of getting lost in the shuffle of things. And the class sizes are big before you count teachers being out on quarantine or absences, the lack of substitutes. I mean, these things have, I'm hearing middle school teachers say, you know, sometimes 50 kids in a classroom. They don't have desks or chairs. They're sitting on random furniture. That is not the way that successful learning is going to happen. And so um, Representative Castor, like you mentioned, it's hard to understand what the end goal of all of this is um, when you should be supporting the state and you know really wanting to show out that you know we have all this money and look what we can do and it seems to be the opposite there seems to be that big picture agenda that is to, to ruin public education and you take all the resources we need and of course it looks really bad and we're all doing the best we can and they're just sitting on the money that we could have Thank you, Emily. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's um, uh, it's so unfortunate that this is the turn the state has taken now for for so many years. And you did hit upon one thing, and it's something that Angie asked about before. Why? Why did they do this? Why? And you know, this is a Florida doesn't have a state income tax, and we do not want one. 
But part of uh, part of having an uh, iota of fiscal responsibility is using the tax sellers we have in a smart way. That means drawing down the emergency aid during the this public health crisis to make sure that students have all of their needs addressed. Means making sure that the children have nutritious meals and drawing down eight hundred and twenty million dollars that could be could help feed our kids. Um, there, there, there's simply a lack of fiscal responsibility in uh, in Tallahassee. It seems like they're just elevating their personal politics over what is in the public interest. And it's time for our, for everyone to kind of rise up and say no. The future of this great state is in a well-educated workforce where kids have a high quality education. And that's one reason I'm so excited if we can now bring in some federal resources to do universal pre-K for all three-year-olds and four-year-olds, we get them more ready to start school. They will, a lot of those needs we can address early, earlier in life and make sure they have the basic literacy uh, uh, and and be the building blocks for for math and science and just just basic health uh, at that young age. So, um, uh, go ahead, Pastor, I just wanted to kind of sum up maybe this whole conversation with a quote from George Bernard Shaw, and he says something to this essence: "To be indifferent, I'm going to say to our students, that's the essence of inhumanity." And I can't think of a better way to talk about what I see going on in Tallahassee is that it's being just humane. I was just heartbroken when I read that he that the governor decided not to use the money for federal food for our students because he said we didn't need it. I literally cried. I wasn't sure what state he was talking about, what children he was talking about, because we have the need. We have students to do to who really need that, as uh, Emily talked about. Students depend on it for breakfast and for lunch and not to be caring, not to be compassionate, not to be realistic is terribly inhumane. Thank you, Doretha. And, and I did see that we were, we had uh, one of our courageous school board members, Nadia Combs, who had put a little question in the chats, chat suggesting that all of the superintendents in the state band together. I think that is a terrific idea and we'll follow up with the, uh, the superintendents uh, association and see if they won't uh, do that now that we're so late. But one of the, re one of the reasons um, that, that it's so important to be fiscally responsible, what they'd like to do, I think, uh, another kind of devious uh, plan is they want these federal dollars to come in and plug holes in the state budget uh, over the next couple of years. They want to be able to, uh, you know, keep taxes for corporations very low and and not use the funds to go directly to public education and our students and schools as they should. Great, so we have two questions that are in a similar vein and we can go live to Pat Hall. Um, you guys should be unmuted, there you go. Thank you, Ricky. Um, I appreciate the time with um, Representative Castor and you have brought up several of the problems that we see. The money is being diverted to voucher schools, to charter schools, to whatever way they can uh, destroy the public school foundation. And um, we appreciate very much your amendment um, proposed to the Congress related to for-profit managed charters. We also have uh, mom and pop charters who have used this as a giant um, retirement pension plan taking 25% of the money for education for themselves as administrators of small mom and pop charters. So there are huge issues that, um, as Paula asked the question about the, uh, what can we do 
to the governor and to Richard Corcoran, who owns and started a charter school in Pasco County, and he's the commissioner of education. Um, I really appreciate what you're saying about the preschool children who need so much support with the poverty we have in Hillsborough County. Um, and I think uh, Doretha's point about the business community, yeah. we really need to involve them in what is going on here. Maybe they can be influential with the governor and our uh, legislature. Hey, thanks, Pat. It's good to good to hear your voice here, and thank you for recognizing uh, my amendment to the federal appropriations bills. And for folks who don't know, uh, there is a lot of evidence out there that many of the for-profit private charters uh, do not have appropriate oversight; that they've been uh, getting away uh, with. Um, with uh, pocketing funds or have acted irresponsibly with public tax dollars and my amendment simply uh, requires the federal department of education to ramp up their oversight of the private for-profit charter corporations they do receive uh, federal funds and it is most appropriate that those funds go to education and students and schools and there's just a lot of uh, evidence out there that that there are bad actors that need to be reined in and then uh, the appropriations chairwoman rosa laro has raised the concern that uh, there's cherry picking out there with many of the private for-profit charters that's having the effect of uh, resegregating our public schools, and we don't want that to, to happen. So uh, I want to thank uh, Congresswoman DeLauro, who chairs the Appropriations Committee, for keeping an eye on that issue, too. Thank you, Congresswoman. So that looks like it on questions. We want to stick to our respectful 6 p.m. Um, close. So Congresswoman, if you would like to lead us in closing remarks. Well, I'm grateful to, to all of the advocates across Hillsborough County, uh, Damaris, Emily, Doretha, all of the teachers and educational um, advocates, everyone who works to keep our kids educated, healthy, and safe. Uh, you are appreciated in our community, and we're not going to give up. I think we'll, we'll plan another one of these town hall meetings and um, Please listen to the advice that's been provided. I think we'll follow up with some business community efforts. Uh, and Damaris, we will. We need to continue to to educate parents, give them the tools they need. Maybe we need to follow up on that as well, so that we can make it easy for for folks to communicate with the governor and the legislature. Uh, but just know we're not going to give up here. We're going to fight to make sure that the monies that were intended to support our students in schools get to our public school students uh, and all of our schools. And uh, appreciate all of you tuning in for the Education Town Hall tonight. Thank you so much. That will conclude today's event. And as I said, if you missed the beginning of today's event, we will be putting it live on Facebook. So keep an eye out tomorrow morning and you can watch this conversation in full. Thank you and stay safe and have a nice night. Thanks.